This is Horror Podcast. Welcome to This Is Horror, a podcast for readers, writers, and creators. I'm Michael David Wilson, and every episode, alongside my co-host, Bob Pastorella, we chat with the world's best writers about writing, life lessons, creativity, and much more. Now, today's episode is a little different. You see, last week, Stephen King released his brand new book, Holly, And to celebrate the occasion, we have put something special together for you. See, over the next few months, we are going to record a Story Unboxed style episode in which we discuss and dissect a Stephen King book featuring Holly Gibney. For those unfamiliar with Story Unboxed, it is usually our Patreon-only podcast in which we dive deep into a short story book or film discussing the story and looking at the writing lessons and takeaways. But for this series of episodes, it is coming to all of you This Is Horror Podcast listeners. So stay tuned for episodes on Mr. Mercedes, Finders Keepers, End of Watch, The Outsider, If It Bleeds, and Holly. Today we are discussing Mr. Mercedes, but before we get into that, an advert break. Twenty years ago, Faith York watched her father get dragged into the earth by a spider-armed woman. Now, after so many years of denial and running, it's time for Faith to go home and face the truth. A spiraling rabbit hole of reopened wounds, shadowy cults, and eldritch horrors await in the ungodly duology. Two novellas by S. H. Cooper. Available now in ebook and paperback from Cemetery Gates Media. Meet Otto and Cecil. Two brothers growing up privileged in the Welsh countryside. They enjoy watching nature shows, playing with their pet pony, impersonating their grandfather, and killing the help. Murder is the family business after all. Downton Abbey, this is not. What this is, the groundbreaking new novel, Not Forever, But For Now, by Chuck Palahniuk. You may know Chuck as the author of Fight Club. Now you'll know him as the author of Not Forever, But For Now wherever books are sold. And we are back. And today, joining us for our discussion on Mr. Mercedes, we have one of my favorite writers and people in the horror genre, the author of books such as Crossroads and Below, to name just two, and forthcoming in October, Silent Key. I'm talking about Laurel Hightower. Laurel, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to have you here. How are you doing? I'm good. And if anyone's wondering, I did, in fact, wear a sleeveless top and I'm propping my arm specifically to show off my tattoo because that's all I do now. This is 35% of my day. It's just, did you did you catch that? So now yeah. that I've done that, I've gotten that over with. But how are, how are you guys? I'm very well, thank you. It, yeah, it, it is an amazing looking tattoo. I I thought that as soon as we put the video on, like those colors are vibrant. It's really popping. The, the oh, audio yeah. listeners are thinking, what the mm-hmm. hell is going on here? Well, well, that's why you've got to watch the YouTube <laughs> version as well. Right. That's the that's the extra benefit. You get to you get to check out High Towers tattoo. But that's okay. If you see me at a con, I'm almost certainly going to be like rolling my sleeves up. Oh, did you? Yeah. Did you, did you need something? <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, Bob, how are you doing? I am doing great, man. I'm glad to be here um, talking about this this awesome book. I, which I've never read. I've seen the series, but uh, I finally got a chance to read this book, and uh, man, I, I really enjoyed it. It was good. Yeah, well, I believe, Bob, that you have a synopsis for Mr. Mercedes, so let's kick off with that. Yes, I do. The stolen Mercedes emerges from the pre-dawn fog and plows through a crowd of men and women online for a job fair in a distressed American city. Then the lone driver backs up, charges again, it speeds off, leaving eight dead and more wounded. The case goes unsolved. An ex-cop, Bill Hodges, is out of hope when he gets a letter 
from a man who loved the feel of death under the Mercedes wheels. Brady Hartsfield wants that rush again, but this time he's going big with an attack that would take down thousands. Unless Hodges and two new unusual allies he picks up along the way can throw a wrench in Hartfield's diabolical plans. And that is Mr. Mercedes. It's a wonderful synopsis. <laughs> I've and never well read too. Yeah. Very exciting. Yeah. Um, I tried hard. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I thought to begin with, it would be useful to talk about you know, the first time that we read Mr. Mercedes and our background coming into this. And so, I mean, for me, I haven't actually read a Holly Gibney book. So this challenge is just, let, let's read them all. Let's get the reaction, you know, to, to coincide with Holly coming out. And wow, what, what an incredible book <laughs> it was. I'm I'm glad that I felt that way. It would have been a little bit awkward if I committed to <laughs> unboxing all of them. And I thought, oh, this one is a dud. But, but no, this, this is incredible. It, it's been... This is going to get better as we go through these, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it's been billed as his first hard-boiled detective novel build was not meant to be a pun there and it <laughs> it you know it, it won the edgar award for 2015 best novel it it just hit some kind of all the notes that you would expect from both hard-boiled and a stephen king story so i really i've been blown away by this one i think it's right up there in in terms of his best books i would agree yeah. Yeah. It's, um, you know, in talking about like this was the, this week was the first time I'd read the book. It was, was not my first experience with Holly Gibney. That was, you know, that came from the outsiders, which uh, or the outsider rather. Yeah. So I read that book, then I seen the series and that got me interested in watching the series, Mr. Mercedes. Uh, and so I, I, I dove into that. And uh, watched all three, you know, seasons of that, which are the the seasons cover each book, but they're kind of told that, you know, the the second two seasons are told out of order. Um, the season, the show never got canceled. It got the the whole program creative platform got canceled. Is what happened. So they they have no you know desire to to make it. It could come back on another platform, you know, possibly. But it's been a long time. I think it was canceled like in 2020. So we were three years out. But yeah, so my, my first experience with, with Holly was through, you know, The Outsider and then the series, which she was played by, I'm probably going to say her name wrong, Cynthia Irvino or Irvno. She fit the book, but she's not the same Holly that's in the series. And she's definitely, Holly's not the same woman that she is in Mr. Mercedes. Um, I think it's, it's why King has grown attached to his character, because each story that she's in, that she reoccurs in, there's a massive amount of growth there. And so, it's yeah, it's about time that he has a book, you know, pretty much dedicated to her. And uh, she's probably one of his most endearing characters, you know, and he's got a bunch of them. Yeah. Oh yeah. And and just for the record, I haven't seen the TV series. I watched the first episode to kind of get into the to, to just see what it was like to prepare myself for this. But yeah, I, I couldn't within the space of the last week read the book, watch the series, and come up <laughs> with critical thought on both. But I, I definitely want to. It you know, it, it started off really wonderfully and with that brutal scene that we're going to get into imminently. But b before then, I mean, Laurel, what has your experience with Mr. Mercedes been? When did you first read it? I could not pin down the year, but I'm going to say it probably wasn't terribly long after it was released. It was, if it was released in 2015, maybe 2017, something like that. 2014. Um, it had, it was with 2014 was when it came yeah. out. Yeah. So some, some more in there. Um, so it's been several years since I've read it and I have also read the second two. Um, mm. 
in a which I will not, you know, obviously spoil anything for on those. But but yeah, I read the the initial trilogy, um, and yeah. So when you you know put out the you know who's excited about this or whatever, <laughs> I was like me because I I do not not to you know, and I know we'll get into some of the stuff. It's definitely not a perfect perfect book, but um, I really you know when you say that it's up there with his best novels, I also think it ranks up there, and Hodges ranks up there with. Uh, some of the best detective stories. I feel like, you know, I was very interested when it was like, oh, you know, he's writing his first like hard-boiled detective story. Mm. And I was like, okay, I want to see how he does with this. And and I thought he did great. Um, he definitely has his spin on it. Um, but I think particularly with this first one, the biggest uh, thing that I noticed that he brought to it was just the the really deep like dive into humanity, the way that he creates these characters so fully. Um, you know, that you really feel something for them and you, you know, you kind of start to get in their heads and like anticipate what they're going to do. And, and in that way, you're kind of almost solving the mystery along with them. So yeah, I, this is, it, Bill Hodges is absolutely one of my favorite um, characters, literary characters ever, let alone uh, Stephen King. So, and maybe I'm on the, on the other end of the spectrum there as far as Holly, who I like very well, but, um, but for this, you know, this trilogy, I feel like Bill's kind of the, Bill's kind of the star, and I, I like him quite a bit. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, the way that it's dubbed, I mean, that this is Hodge's trilogy. So <laughs> I, I guess that it, yeah, that it's right that you're at least meant to, if not like him the most, then certainly kind of follow him the most. And Bill's arc in this book, in Mr. Mercedes, I mean, he, he starts off, so flawed he starts off like borderline misogynistic with some some things um but i so i i can see people being frustrated initially but then like you know when you get to the end of the book by the way we always completely spoil whatever we're unboxing so if you haven't read it you might want to turn off now but yeah, by 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 the time we get to the end, we see just how masterfully everything has been orchestrated, and that he's got a redemptive arc. Like he he's realized all of his flaws, he's addressed them, and it's all resolved. And actually, I mean, interestingly, to begin with, the Mercedes killer, Brady Hartsfield, I would argue is actually more self-aware than Bill Hodges is. Yeah, not certainly not remotely likable, but I think that's a good argument as far as like, because it because King does go into quite a bit about Brady's thought process and how he, you know, I, he has a line in there that's so interesting where he's, I think he's talking about his uh, sexuality and he's like, he was mm -hmm. a, something like a, a, an unknown to himself or like a blank wall to himself about something like that. Like, so it's, it is really clear with little things like that, how much time he spent sort of reflecting on himself, which of course in his context is probably somewhat narcissistic, but yeah, he's, he's definitely more aware. Yeah. And I mean, cause there's so much packed into Mr. Mercedes. We've almost got a choose your own adventure situation here. So do, do we want to talk, more in depth about Bill Hodges and his character and his arc. Do we want to talk a little bit about Brady and perhaps his sexuality and his relationship with his mother? Or do we want to just jump in to the Mercedes attack, that brutal opening? I I mean, I I feel like we can kind of hit on all of that along the way, but it might be useful to do it in sort of a chronological fashion, because like you said, there's the arc, you know, along with, mm. so it's, a, that just might be the most linear way to do it. Plus it's a hell of a scene. Yeah. I mean, I can, I can speak on it. That scene for me is like really rough because I have been in line at a job fair very early in the morning. So um, I know what it's like. And the amount of time that you stand in one spot and you just want to sit down and you're afraid you're going to lose your spot. So I, I felt a very, you know, felt very kindred to these people who are just there because they're, they're trying to get a job They're That's, that's why they're there. And the, to me, the utter brutality 
of someone just decides to drive their fucking car into them because they got some kind of thrill out of it. People like that, I, you know, when you when you find when you finally get the bill and you see what what not solving that case has done to him, I'm like, I get it. I get it because Bill Bill's the type of guy. He's the type of character who that if he if they would have caught Brady, then and if Bill would have been on the scene, Bill would have probably strangled him to death because he's just that type of guy. And that that's a completely wrong approach. As we see Bill grow in this story, we see that Bill still feels that way. He's he's become honest with himself. But he knows it's not the right thing to do. But goddamn, he does so many wrong things, <laughs> you know. So, but that that scene, I think that that's probably one of the best prologues that I've ever read. Uh, because and it, it's it's not even. I think it is listed as a prologue. I may be wrong, but it does. It, it's a scene. It's a setup. It gets you into the moment. It makes you realize that these people were completely innocent and had no. No, they they needed help. That's why they were in line. They needed a job, and some more desperate than others. And then we never get to see these characters again because they're dead. But we care so much about them yeah. in such yeah. a brief spot of time. And I think you know, Bob, that's really such a good point about the relation there, the humanity of it, because you know, you're talking about standing in that line. And I feel like that's maybe part of what had so much impact because he's writing about, you know, the time after the 2008 market crash and, Mm -hmm. you know, it's a recession and everybody's broke and everybody's hopeless. And the way that he conveys in such a short period of time, these characters that, like you said, have such a short stage time, uh, but we see their humanity. We see Augie's kindness, you know, and, and his own worries. And we see, you know, Janice and, and her, everything that's going on with her and the, you know, the hope that they find in hopelessness there, like, uh, you know, in line and the way that that is so cruelly destroyed. And, and I, you know, he mentions too, like before Augie, before Augie realizes this guy's coming at them and he's like, is this the mayor? There's a, you know, it's kind of a bad look showing up in a Mercedes. And I think there is such impact with that too, that not only are these people, who are trying their damnedest, you know, to, to find a foothold in the way things have gone in the world. Not only are they mowed down in that point of hope, but they're mowed down by like a, a car that costs, you know, more than some of their homes, I'm sure. And that, that's so poignant. It is. And it's, and when you, as you go through the story and you realize that it was just a car that, your aspect of what you just mentioned, it was not, it was like the furthest thing from Brady's mind. It was like, this is a lot of horsepower and it can do a lot of damage. And that's, you know, he didn't see the, the socioeconomic status part of it. If he did, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't that important to him, but it's important to us. It's important to Bill, Bill, you know, and we see everything through Bill's eyes and that's, you know, it, it, it colors the entire story. Yeah, I mean, these characters in, in the opening, they're so well painted that it it genuinely felt like, okay, I'm being introduced to the protagonist here. That's what I thought was going on on that, on that mm-hmm. reading, which, I mean, King has this ability, he does it so frequently to make you care for characters so quickly. So... As you say, it just makes the impact of when everybody, you know, when when they're plowed into and then eight people are killed, we never see anyone again. It's just brutal. It's like, mm-hmm. well, what have you done to me? <laughs> and in a few pages, but I mean, I, I understand that that was inspired by, or. Oh, I don't know if even inspired is the right word here, but uh, King hearing about a woman driving her car into a McDonald's and then late, later on, I mean, he, he actually saw some something very similar happened in the news. He, he was talking about in the local news, um, he, he was at 
a motel king was and he saw the story about a woman who had ran her car into a line of job seekers and it's it's so kind of t terrifying how like f fiction and reality they seem to have so many parallels and we'll get into it later but even like the the final kind of like set piece with with brady i mean when i was reading that and we've got you know concert goers that are primarily uh women and young children it really reminded me of what happened in manchester i think in was it about 2017 at the ariana oh, grande God, yeah. concert and so i yeah. after i'd read i had to check the timing on that but you know that happened three years or so later also that the timing occurred as such that this book when so i i think king had started writing it in 2012 and then about three months before it came out there was you know what went down at the boston marathon so he he'd of course written it before but i i think like king was quite i mean he he described that the boston marathon bombings is too creepily close for comfort he said and yeah it's, i mean we, we've seen before as well like with like like movies and books they, they've had to change the marketing because something has happened that has been too close to reality i know with adam neville's the ritual um something happened in in like vegas a shooting and they they'd had on the movie marketing saying something like should have gone to vegas and they thought oh, shit. and they thought well, we're gonna get rid of that now we're not gonna yeah. should have gone to <laughs> vegas i remember that yeah yeah you know and one of the the things i was just you know it, it's like it, it king was very present and I always say this word, he's kind of predicting what we're seeing right now. Uh, and and here's the thing, and, but not really, because after 9-11, um, you know, I remember watching on news and they said, you know, that people are like, the, the, you know, the people overseas and everything are, are our biggest threat. And his terrorism expert, a U.S. terrorism expert said, no, they're not. Domestic terrorism is our biggest threat has been and will be and damn it it's true yeah and you know and so reading this book and we talk about you know you have bill who i mean granted he he's he's flawed uh he but he, king's ability to even like with augie and the people in, in the opening scene he, he he has an ability to quickly make you relate to someone Okay, and that makes for compelling characters, which is why you give a shit about them. Um, we give a shit about Bill because we can relate to him. We know what it feels like to lose. We know what it feels like to, to be having something right there in the palm of your hand and you just can't figure it out. Um, no matter if it's something as simple as where's my fucking glasses or I'm trying to catch a guy who ran over people. Okay, so we can relate to that. It's very relatable. We can relate to Brady in, on a level that we don't like to talk about in public. But if we're honest with ourselves, there are parts of Brady that we can actually relate to, uh, which make us feel disgusted and make us feel sick about ourselves. But at the same time, that's a compelling character. Brady's not likable at all. He's not a likable character. He is the perfect example of why you should not write a likable character. You have to write a compelling character. So he's like, you know, the, and that's why the, the, the chapters alternate. Bill, Brady, Bill, Brady, you know. So it's, I think they're, they're two sides of the same coin. And um, that's, that's, that was the impression that I, that I got. Um, it's like they, they, their flaws complement each other. What do you think are some of the relatable aspects of Brady? Frustration. Um, 
in in anything fear anxiety um paranoia these are these are things that we don't like to talk about and it's you know it's because um you know in in a lot of people who suffer from you know mental illnesses and things like that um we we everyone feels anxiety everyone gets paranoid everyone um gets depressed about things um everyone has feelings of inadequacy how we handle these feelings and how we we cope with these feelings make us you know makes the decision between whether you're going to plow in you know plow into a field of or plow, plow into people waiting to get a job in a Mercedes, or you're going to go about your life and try to figure out how to make things better. So that's, that's the, those are the things that are relatable. Those are things that, that we all feel. Okay. King takes them to an extreme level. Also, one of the things I noticed in reading the book was it kind of answers the question of, Hey, are killers, are they nurtured or is it nature? In Brady's case, it was nature. He was never raised to be a killer. He was bad from the get-go. Mm-hmm. I don't think I felt that he his character was completely bad from the very, very beginning of once he realized that he was a bad person. His life, his home life was absolutely horrendous, but he could have gotten better with that. He could have coped with that. But my feeling is is that he was evil from the beginning. I'm really surprised at that conclusion <laughs> and how strongly you're coming out with it. Um, I mean, he, he lost his father at eight. I think there's a very good argument that actually his mom has been abusing him his entire life. I mean, she forced him to kill his mentally handicapped brother. They're in this Norman Bates style relationship where i think she's the instigator there is a moment where he goes to kiss her cheek and she responds by slipping her tongue in like i don't know if you caught that but i did catch that i did catch that but i feel that even when when we're reading this section when he talks about how his father died and we're reading it as though we're we're reliving Brady's history. Even at such a young age, Brady doesn't care about his father dying. Oh well, that's the that's the impression I got. Maybe it hurt him so bad that he pushed it aside and didn't care about it no more. He didn't care about the new dad. He didn't care about the babysitter, or not the new dad, but Bob's new boyfriend. He didn't care about any of that. He he had these kind of evil intentions. He didn't care about his brother. But this is also all happening while he's still being abused. <laughs> like, you know, you say maybe it's a little bit difficult to care about things when somebody is frequently abusing you, Bob. I understand that. But I don't get the impression that he realized that he was... And, and, and here's the thing. Yeah, you push a lot of things aside. But to me, reading the story... I I felt that he was kind of bad to begin with. Yes, he was being abused. There's no doubt about it. And he probably pushed those memories and repressed those memories back until the point where he wanted to remember them and wanted to make some significance out of them. But I also think that this guy, this is a kid who was probably kind of a bad egg. You know, that's the impression that I got. It's a, Well, it's an interesting, you know, like you said, with nature versus nurture, like it sounds like your conclusion would be that regardless of what sort of home life he had, he was bound to do something like this, that he just sort of had that disconnect. Do you, is that? That's what, exactly what I'm saying. That regardless okay. of what his home life would have been, we're talking about somebody who possibly had a major disconnect, possibly, you know, some type of emotional thing that doesn't relate to anything else. He's just disconnected and doesn't give a shit about anything. And I am a big proponent of most of the time these things happen because of how you're raised. So for me to see that, I don't know, it, 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 it felt very strong to me. That's my perception of it. So it's not if I'm right or wrong or anything like that. It's not, it's not like that. It's just how I perceived his character that he was bad from the get go. 
I feel like a talk show host. Michael, you seem to be disagreeing. Would you I'm like very, to rebut? I'm, I'm very <laughs> much disagreeing. He, he, he agrees with me. He, he disagrees with everything I say. So I mean, yeah. Bob and I frequently <laughs> disagree. I didn't know that we would get into something so heated so early, but I'm here for it. And I mean, th this is part of a wider conversation that we've touched on before in this as horror episodes about whether somebody can be born evil. I'm not sure that I go along with that at all. I, I, it's a very bleak view of the world. And I don't like to believe that, you know, this, this child is destined to be a bad person. Of course, you know, so sociopathy is real there is the science to to prove that but i believe the way in which we nurture somebody can certainly affect their actions and who they ultimately turn out to be so even if we can agree that okay by a clinical definition brady hartsfield was and is a sociopath even if we can agree that he's suffering from a lot of mental illness, I can't go along with the idea that whatever had happened to him, whatever family he was born into, he was going to end up being a mass murderer. I just, it, it seems that conclusion for me seems to defy logic. I don't see how that was always inevitable. Laurel, let's jump in with some of your thoughts. <laughs> I think what I I tend to agree that I feel like his his nurture was god awful, and I think it's one of those things that it's so bad and so traumatizing on so many levels. Because whatever his memories are of like you know how things were before his father died, somebody doesn't become that abusive overnight. I don't think, as far as his mother's concerned. So I'm sure that it was never awesome. Um, and I don't know, I think when you were talking about the things that we relate with Brady about, I feel like one of the first thing that came to my mind was the powerlessness of it. Um, he's powerless. Well, it's, it's, it is interesting though. And I feel like, and Michael, you might, um, and this isn't, I, I sort this isn't going to come across as like, well, if you don't have children, you can't possibly understand, but it, it's more one of these things that I feel like I've thought about a lot more deeply since becoming responsible mm. for, you know, the raising of, a, of another human is noticing how much little things can affect them. Um, just things like, and this is, you know, I was reading a book uh, that they, that they kind of talked about this and pointed it out and it kind of blew my mind. They were talking about how um, when children have uh, what a person would consider a negative emotional reaction, let's say a tantrum. So they lose their temper, you know, they're, they have a fit in public and the immediate response, actually, whether you're in public or not, the immediate response is I want my child to stop crying. And it doesn't mm. have to be a shut up, you little bastard, but it can be a, oh my goodness, you're upset. I want you to feel better. And when, and he talked about how when we immediately go to that and don't let them just experience that, the message that we send is if you are not cheerful, you're not lovable. You know, that when you have a, a, a tantrum when you have a fit of anger when you have even a fit of just you know sadness about something like i really wanted that toy and and i can't have it and those are things that are disappointments i mean show me the adult that's never been disappointed because they couldn't get what they wanted um you know and it's just was very sort of mind-blowing to me how like just little things we can do that have a massive impact on children um, and so when you think about, you know, something larger like that, when you think about, you know, going back to the powerlessness that Brady feels, he's felt powerful or powerless his entire life. Um, and then when you put that alongside the powerlessness of the people who are in that line, um, it is, you know, it, it has so much to do with like, and, and yes, the nature nurture argument, I feel like is one that's never going to be resolved because so much so much, uh, you know, goes into it because there's also like the, okay, let's say that, you know, you have two different kids who are both born with like a, a disconnect that way that would set them up for sociopathy. Um, although I really, I like your British pronunciation of that better sociopathy. <laughs> sociopathy. That just sounds better. It sounds cleaner. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> you know, I, it's, 
it's just one of these things that like, what is, what is the magic ingredient? What is the thing? And is it simply that they're never shown the right way? Is it simply that they're never given any sort of positive reinforcement, any sort of other way to be, you know, I, I feel like, I feel like it's, it's a lot sort of involved. I don't know. And I, and I'm also now rambling. So sorry. No, <laughs> but... no, it's, it, it's all really relevant. And I mean, I, I think as well, like up until a certain age, like children don't really have empathy on the level that adults do as well. So, I mean, if you're kind of uh, enforcing adult standards on the behavior of a child and then being like that, that's looking a little bit uh, sociopathic to me, then you're going to a false conclusion there, I guess. And I mean, also like one of the things that Bob cited as his kind of evidence for this, this was nature was the reaction. <laughs> I can see Bob laughing at me using the word <laughs> evidence, like this is, this is your impassioned. But the, the, the reaction to his father's death, and as Bob put it, like, oh, oh well, he's dead. Not, but, but different people process things in different ways and maybe even at that age he's been shown that to give a more visceral or explosive reaction is something that is punished is something that is nailed down so i feel i i just feel that bob's conclusion is too strong for the evidence presented i don't think that we can say definitively this was always his nature. I also don't want to believe it. And I, I think we can be predisposed to different things, but I think there's a lot within, you know, our environment that can be the difference between whether we, we go out and kill a, a load of people or become the CEO of a <laughs> big corporation. Yeah. I'm not yeah. saying that all CEOs are sociopaths but but you're I mean, not it, not saying it. Well, I, I, i'm not, just not, saying yeah. if you're a sociopath <laughs> that is a better use of your skills than it yes. is to go out and <laughs> <laughs> laurels may be disagreeing with that. that that's not a topic for this podcast whatever like being yeah. a CEO we'll, or ne we'll never killer. get we'll yeah. never even get to holly if we if we go yeah. down that path but yeah. Yeah. just you know if you how how do you gauge at a young age? I don't have children, so I don't know. But how would you gauge at a young age if there is a disconnect, especially if they're if they're affected with grief, if they're affected with a powerlessness of the mom be, not being able to to provide for the family, uh, for mom having inadequate feelings about uh, even sexual feelings to, to you know to her own child um, because she's lonely and 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 things like that so how do you know that there wasn't i know it's like yeah but, but okay yeah Ugh. but I know, you know, i'm not saying you're excusing it all it's just like that's not a good reason no but how do you how do you know <laughs> if there's the disconnect or not the thing is is that you don't you know and so me in my perception of this it's not like i said it's not a right or wrong thing i just feel that that there's a possibility that brady was bad from from the get-go because there was a disconnect there it was early on and it may have been brought on by by uh by something emotional but it could have been just a disconnect it could have been um like any type of uh you know any other thing that you would find in 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 any type of, of mental acuity or mental illness or anything like that things are on a sliding scale he may have been pushed so far over that he just had a complete, you know, like almost like a natural disconnect to things where I don't, I didn't see any type of emotional involvement. Of course, we are getting this kind of from Brady's perspective. So at the time where his mindset is kind of also, you know, King Stain in character here, you know, so it is nihilistic. It is, it is very, um, I don't know. I found it very captivating reading, um, but I just got this impression that he was bad. He's certainly not sympathetic. Um, he's, I think it's an interesting way that King does that because it's like, you know, he does great with like 
this isn't just a one dimensional, like he's bad because I say he's bad. You know, it's, it's, right. you're seeing his, his home life. You're seeing the way that he is, but he's so unpleasant to everyone that he deals with. And it's like, you can look and be like, oh, they're okay. That's an awful life, you know, that he's living in the, but it's also just like, you, you don't like him anyway. Like there's no part of me that wants to be like, gee, I wonder if we could get you some counseling. It's more like, oh, please stay away. You know, you're, you're j- just his, his thoughts about his coworkers, his thoughts about, you know, his, his innate bigotry, all of that kind of stuff is so off-putting and he just doesn't, you know, he, he doesn't have any redeeming qualities, I feel like. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think that Brady's mother has killed before, you know, that the brother is killed? Cause I, there's just something about the way that it's described, it almost seems clinical and like this was not her first rodeo. And that, you know, that the whole character is a red flag. So I I think there's a possibility, and maybe we'll never know this, unless Laurel's like, actually, you find out in the second or third book, which you haven't (laughs) read yet. (laughs) But I, I, I feel we'll never quite know, you, you know, whether, was the mother a kind of bigger serial killer than than Brady? But she was better at her job. She was never caught. <laughs> I would say, and I know you didn't really ask it as a question, but like if, you know, as far as like, do we think this is the first time she's killed? I'd say it's not the first time she has coerced someone into doing her bidding that, that was completely, you know, um, lacking Immoral. in any morality. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> That's that. That's the impression that I get from her. But you know, because because she doesn't seem very hands on, so she, she seems incredibly manipulative. Yeah, that's the that's the impression I got too. I mean, that I would be I would be almost shocked if she if she had actually killed someone, uh, you know, her her own self without having someone else do it for. Her. Um, you know, the scene with Frankie is is very. It's a very rough scene. It's a very yeah. bad scene. Uh, it's an important scene, but I had a hard time doing it. And so I and I read the book and listened to the audio uh, book at the same time. So uh, I was reading, and then when I couldn't actually hold a book in my hand or hold my kid on my hand, I was actually listening to it. And I was glad I had Will Patton with me to to take me through this because <laughs> he's phenomenal in these books, and uh, he's a great actor. And he he handled it very well. I think that if I actually would have not heard a voice in my head and just heard a narrator's voice in my head reading it, then it would probably would have really been rough for me because those scenes are, are rough. They're really rough. King definitely doesn't shy away from the rough parts of that. No, no, no. And I I think we should touch on too that I mean with, with the Mercedes, we later find out it was. Stolen, it was Olivia Trelawney's Mercedes, and then like Olivia's treatment is is terrible. Like she becomes a scapegoat who like like the, there is severe victim blaming from the entire town, including Bill, and she's driven to suicide. And I mean it yeah, th- this was like kind of one of the first points where it's like oh bill bill has some things that he needs to work on now he <laughs> I, I i would say again that he he becomes aware of that at the end he realizes what he's done but i mean i, I don't even really know what there is to say about the the treatment of olivia but it it was incredibly uncomfortable reading as of course was the intention of king but i i felt that there almost became more emphasis to for some chapters on olivia's mistakes rather than the fact that there was somebody who has literally gone out there and murdered a bunch of people i think i really appreciated the way he hit that though because you know bill is definitely he contributed to that but i thought it was interesting the way that even before he really gets going on this he admits to himself he's like yeah i didn't like her 
I did not like her. And that made it easy mm. for me to want to throw some of this at her door. You know, he's looking at all the little quirks about her that make her unlikable. She's, um, you know, she's very out of touch. She's pretty selfish. And, you know, she's got these obnoxious little things, these little ticks and these quirks and stuff, but he doesn't, it's so interesting the way that, I don't know, that that he becomes aware that like, oh, you know what? The fact that I didn't like all these little things about her and the fact that mm. I so easily, easily reached, you know, leapt to this conclusion of really disliking this woman and knowing that his partner was also not unbiased in that. Um, and, you know, sort of reflecting on like, ah, that might be where we fucked up, you know, is that we did. Because, yeah, I mean, you're right, Michael. Like, I, I hadn't even really thought about that. But, like, why did they spend so much damn time, like, questioning her? Like, okay, yeah. maybe she lied about the key. Maybe she didn't. You know she's not the one that drove the car into the people. So let it go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think that, and I don't know, I don't know how they do it in criminal investigations. And, obviously, they were investigating a crime. But, I mean... One of the things that comes up in crimes like this is, um, at least from from my experience on it, is negligence. Mm-hmm. Um, so they could be looking at it from, you know, hey, you were you were you were negligent. You you weren't guilty, but you le- you gave the the guilty party a path. So your negligence led to this. So um, that was that was that was my impression of it, and it. And she, you know, and when I'm, nobody likes dealing with the police, nobody does. I mean, and you don't want to be on the other side of that table. You don't want to be talking to them, answering questions because they're going to scrutinize every single way, what you say and how you say it. And when you have somebody who has never been questioned by the police, who has her own little idiosyncrasies and things like that. And then the, the police begin to suspect that possibly she's not telling the truth or she can't remember. And it's very aggravating and everything like that. And they don't like her to begin with. Da, 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 da. You know, that's they, they should have just left her alone because that just that contributed to to her suicide as much as Brady did. I mean, it's just, you know. They they were barking up the wrong tree with that. They had no reason to do it. Other than the only thing I could think of is they were trying to establish some sense of negligence. That that was the only impression I had on that. So let's talk about the correspondence between the Mercedes killer, Brady, and Bill Hodges. So I mean that this starts off with Brady of effectively taunting Hodges and telling him to kill himself and telling him, you know, his life is a failure and he hasn't caught him. And it's, yeah, it's very true to a lot of serial killers and a lot of cases that we've seen before. Yeah. And the element of responsibility with respect to driving someone else to take their own life is, I've always thought that's a very poignant and you know, fairly complicated issue, I guess. I mean, on on the face of it, it doesn't seem like it's complicated. It's like, dude, you did this. You're, you know, you're guilty. You suck. Um, but it, you know, there's, it just, I know it can't be viewed exactly the same way, but the, I, I thought it was really interesting um, the way that he attempted to disguise his speaking and writing patterns. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, effectively with mm. uh because yeah he gives a very different impression of himself um in in the letters that he sends and, and of course his the impression he gives in the letter he sends olivia trelawney is is completely different as well um I, yeah i i think the correspondence aspect of it is very interesting yeah yeah and w- with regards to the writing as soon as it became obvious that he was trying to disguise himself it just sent my brain kind of down a rabbit hole wondering like okay what parts of this are real what parts aren't and you know even with the the classic perk perp it's like is is this deliberate is this unintentional um and and then you know i mean everything he writes is apart from that is very precise so you, you know, grammatically and in, in terms of spelling and things. But I, I, I was kind of waiting for him to throw like another <laughs> kind of odd, odd ball in just to, to see if it could catch Bill off. I was also 
wondering, you know, because we, we've seen this before, are, are we going to have like kind of copycat correspondence? Are we going to get a fake letter at, at any point from someone who wants to be the Mercedes killer? But no, that that didn't happen. But I did wonder if we were going to go down that line. Yeah, that would have probably added a good 50 pages minimum <laughs> Yeah, to the plot, yeah. I would say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I mean, of course, rather than Bill turning the letter over to, to his partner, to Pete Huntley, he, he decides, no, th this, is, this is for me to investigate. So, I mean, there's, there's like a, a constant like tug of war between Brady and Bill for power and who has the upper hand. They're both constantly trying to outdo each other but i mean he brady won in the sense of giving bill the bait to take and <laughs> you know he he decided yeah i am gonna investigate him but then i mean we also know from bill's character that like well he he's probably the most competent person or the person most capable of actually being able to capture Brady, but I think that was part of the thrill. That was part of the game for him. Well, that and Brady did the opposite of what he intended. Initially, he was hoping he could just sort of push him over the edge to suicide, and it did the opposite. Uh, and I think a big part of the reason, the impression I get is a big part of the reason Bill doesn't turn over the letter is because he doesn't want this new lease on life he's had, this new motivation to do something other than what he's been doing. He doesn't want to let go of that. He's been reawakened and he doesn't want to, he, wa he doesn't want to step back from that. Yeah, I feel the same way. I mean, it was to me that in the book, he, 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 he was right there. If he wanted to got that letter, this would have been a very short and sad, you know, short story, <laughs> you know, um, about, you know, the, and it would probably would have been a lot more, a lot less action-y, <laughs> you know, but it's like, yeah, this happened and then this happened and then in the end, <laughs> you know, so this reawakening and also this and detectives have a sense of pride that they, they don't like to lose. They like to figure it out. There's a puzzle, and it's 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 a moral play, and they they have to figure it out. And when you can't figure out one, um, it, it's like it's like you know the only way I can describe it, it's like losing something <laughs> that you need, and you have no idea where it went, and you've rattled your brain, and then you get some clue years later that could lead you to the thing that you lost, you know, and you're like, oh man. You're not going to tell a soul about it because you've got it now, you know. And so there's that pride thing, you know. And I can imagine it's only more stronger if you're a detective. You know, if you've spent years doing this and you've collared so many criminals, and then all of a sudden you get this one and you just can't get it. Man, that's, he's back in the hunt. That's the way I see it. And he ain't, he ain't going to let it go. It's his identity. Exactly. It's he's he's regained that sense of identity. I work for lawyers and it is very, very common to have a very hard time getting lawyers out of the saddle. Like mm. they will just because that's, you know, when they consider so many will consider retirement and then come back and then retire and then come back. And it's it it's that sense of worth, I guess. Mm hmm Is this kind of something that you apply specifically to criminal law or do you think it's kind of a, across the spectrum to all lawyers it feels across the spectrum i don't i'm not gonna say it's every lawyer because i definitely have known some lawyers who were like middle fingers and they're like bye guys you're not gonna hear <laughs> yeah. from me again and you, you yeah. know and you don't and I, I i applaud that but um no and i don't i don't actually do criminal law so these are these are more just folks i think that it's just it's been their life you know and mm. it's part of where when you've built that way up in the firm people look up to you pardon me that always happens when you're talking you just get choked on yourself yeah, the the amount of times that like 
<clears throat> that I choke on my own saliva and I'm like, how have I not learned to be a human being yet? <laughs> it's like, what did you choke on? <laughs> my own saliva, that's what. Yeah. what. What did you trip on? My other foot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that, that too. Yeah. I wasn't expecting it to be there, you know? And you get my age, the ground comes up a lot faster. It's like when you were a kid and you fell, like you tripped over your own foot. The ground was so slow. You floated down. It was amazing. <laughs> and now it's just like, damn, it's like, it's like, it's not even seconds. It's like you fall and there's the ground. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's what you get to look forward to. <laughs> well, but you know, from, from Stephen King's perspective, or I guess Bill Hodges, boy, when you're a woman in your forties, it's amazing if you would actually want to sit in bright sunlight. I read that line and thought it was hysterical it just made me think of it when you're like oh yeah at my age and, and he's like oh yeah she's a woman in her 40s not afraid to sit in bright sunlight i'm like are we are we vampires are we just so <laughs> ugly once we reach a certain age that we must hiss and hide i just thought it was like but yeah it's you know kind of goes into that uh mild misogyny you mentioned <laughs> yeah that Hodge just has a little bit of a hard time i just thought that i i wrote the line down because i thought it was so funny i'm like wow, yeah. okay yeah <laughs> But I mean, talking about the letters, and I mentioned Brady's self-awareness. I mean, there's a bit in 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 one of the letters, like I mean, literally in chapter one, where he says, "Now you are probably thinking, what kind of sick and twisted pervo do we have here?" And then he goes on to talk about not having a conscience, and like I found that that was yeah. He, he kind of knows what his nature is, or he at least knows how people perceive him. Whereas, you know, when you're seeing Hodges, like, make <laughs> these comments about 40-year-old women, <laughs> I'm not sure that he's aware what he's doing there. Probably not, yeah. And but... I think King is probably aware, you know, because of the way that it concludes. I suspect if he wasn't aware, Tabitha would make him aware. Because yeah. I'm sure she reads his stuff and she would be like, I'm sure this is not how you personally think. Right, Steve? Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> of course not, honey. Never. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's a, he's a well-rounded character. I mean, we're talking about Bill. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Stephen King. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and so in, 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 there's got to be parts of that character that we don't agree with or don't align with or don't like, you know, um, I didn't, I don't, I'm, I try not to be, uh, very misogynist. I grew up around that atmosphere and it's always made me feel uncomfortable. I don't like it. It's not, it's disrespectful. It's, uh, it's, it's not healthy. And so I recognize it very quickly and Bill, Bill's, you know, he's very misogynistic. Um, but he's also by himself, you know what I'm saying? It's like, you cut him a little slack. You sit by yourself. You ain't got nobody in a relationship. You kind of get a little, you get a little biased, right? So he was a well-rounded character. Um, he, but I mean, some of the things he says were cringy. <laughs> Just, I, I, I cringed. Sorry. <laughs> but I like, I, I like that though, because I, I really prefer a flawed protagonist and mm -hmm. these aren't flaws. Like I kind of like had, I, you, I wouldn't really consider it an argument, but I was talking with a friend of mine about reading and like, she was like, you know, I, I love reading JD Robb because you know, the character's flawed. I'm like, she's flawed because she doesn't like kids and she cusses, but otherwise she's drop dead gorgeous, has the perfect life, you know, all this stuff. I'm like, that's not a flaw. That's like when people are like, oh yeah, she's clumsy because she falls over. That makes her awkward. It's like, no, put a little more thought into this. And, and the flaws that he puts into these folks are there. I don't, I don't know. They seem a lot more human because the whole thing with like Hodges is that, yeah, he's a victim of his own life. You know, who he grew up around the job that he's done his age, you know, he's in his sixties and he has interacted with women a certain way. And I, I you know, I, the the age of the protagonist in this is one of the things that I like, and the fact that mm -hmm. his love interest is you know not not a twenty year old. You know, I really enjoy reading uh, because you know we're I'm I'm not twenty, and uh, you know I'm I'm gonna 
anyways, I, I, I like reading, you know, more about like older characters some, because I, I don't know, I like having that whole panoply. That's probably not the right use of that word, but anyway. Yeah, it's very refreshing. Yeah. Me, you know, I, I know exactly how Laura feels because I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm older and I'm older and it's, re- it's refreshing to, to see that people in their 50s, 60s, 70s can still be a protagonist, still be strong, still be good when uh, there's just so much of a glut of fiction where all the heroes are in their 20s. I'm like, shit, they ain't been in my 20s in a long time. I can't even think <laughs> about it. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I like the romance of it too, though. I like, it's just, you know, in particular, and I'm a sucker for romance. Like I, I love it. You know, it's one of my favorite elements of stories when it's included. Um, but I like, you know, when he hooks up with Janie, like it's, yeah. it's awkward. Like it's, you know, her, her sweater gets stuck on her hair clip and, you know, just all this stuff. And I'm just like, yeah, like, I, I don't know. I like the humanity of it. I like, yeah, I like all those things. It's like, yeah, these are, these are just people fucking up a lot. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think the relationship between Hodges and Janie is very endearing. It's very sweet, and I mean, I mean, of course, they they meet up because you know she she hires him to investigate the the suicide of her sister Olivia and the theft of the Mercedes. But so so awkward circumstances to meet. But yeah, that there's something about their relationship and their interactions with each other and i mean even like their first sexual encounter it's like you you could have gone a really kind of cliched path and and particularly with the kind of hints at borderline misogyny but you know actually that first encounter jane is like no this one is for me we are doing it for me i have not had sex in a long time i am going Mm -hmm. to orgasm this is going to be pleasurable (laughs) you you just fucking stay there next time you get to do your thing but (laughs) just let me have Mm -hmm. this one and he does (laughs) <laughs> there's there's a brutal honesty in that mm. that you have to admire because you don't see that in in other words it just makes it real you know um when you have people who are like who can especially jane janie's brutally honest person uh even after that scene you know yeah. and she's like you know basically you know you know i'll risk you even being on top but you gotta lose 20 pounds yeah, yeah. you know yeah. like yeah. You know, let's go ahead let's let's do touch on the whole fat phobia thing because yeah. my god yeah that's <laughs> it's all over this book it is it's uh but I mean, you know, here's the thing. Like I said, Bill's Bill's a well-rounded character in more ways than one. <laughs> you know? so he's 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 a big man. He's he's put on a couple of pounds. Uh, I've been there, you know. Uh, I've had doctors shame me because I was overweight, you know. So I mean, I, I, it it hurts. I think as and well. So, yeah, let's. It. It's bizarre because also, like, you know, there's a thing about, you know, she typically prefers bigger men. and, and mm-hmm. but, but then, like, she's like, you need to lose 20 pounds to be on top. It's like, do, do you not logistically know how, how this could work? Like, he's not going <laughs> right. to kill you. <laughs> like, <laughs> but, yeah, I mean. I'm, I'm also trying to picture how that atmosphere changes because, you know, it, it's just, I mean, what, as a woman, somebody says that to me, I'm, I'm not going to even put on my clothes before I slam out of there. Like, you know, I, you, yeah. So I don't know. I guess it's just like, really? Is that how that would go? Okay, sure. I don't know. I, it, it seems like it's a little bit of a mood killer, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it's not going to be a mood enhancer. I'm not going to get more <laughs> turned on. <laughs> oh, I like it when you fat some... shame me. <laughs> <laughs> Keep doing it. <laughs> it's too, it's too, br- too brutally honest. <laughs> it's brutally honest, but then it goes <laughs> off the deep end. Yeah. Well, Janie's clearly flawed too, so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure about 
the the reaction because like on one hand yeah it's not going to feel great yeah having somebody insult you like that when you're naked ouch but on the other hand i i think he he really he really enjoys having sex with Janie, so I'm trying to weigh up, like how how would how would I feel? It's like how much is he into her? And I I think like I I, I do think you're right that like if if it's a woman getting that from a man, she's out of there. But like, do not underestimate how much men think with their dicks. It's like well, it wasn't a great comment, but. Uh, round round two mm-hmm. <laughs> like, okay <laughs> what, what, what a great comment but you know what i'm gonna let that one slide well what about you bob i i <laughs> what, what, what's your what's your reaction in this situation uh i don't know man i, I mean <laughs> I know how I would react. My reaction would probably be, well, yeah, yeah, you ain't so slim either. But, you know. This would definitely <laughs> help the mood. Like, oh, yeah. yeah. But exactly, <laughs> exactly. It's like, why would you even go there? You know? If things were really, really great, I'd be probably tempted to go, you're right. You're exactly right. I'm going to the gym Monday. you have to Monday. keep doing all the work. Oh, well, yeah. I'll just stay down here. Yeah. I'll, uh, you know? You're exactly right. Um I don't want to argue, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so depends, it depends on situations, you know, um, I think that a poor Bill may be, um, in a situation like, man, I ain't saying shit. I ain't saying shit. Cause I ain't got shit in a while. <laughs> so I'm going to stick with what I got right now and just go As part of this <laughs> episode release. You need to add a poll to it. Like what's your response? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I got us on this train and I should volunteer to somehow get us away from it. But we, we should do a, a Twitter and an, an X poll on this. Like, let's see. Yeah. What, what's your reaction in this situation? Do you, A? You know, and I've been looking for an excuse to leave Twitter. So yeah, so you're gonna do that and then bounce, like never check the answers. I'll be gone before that happens. Yeah, and he brings it over to Blue Sky. You fuck, quit checking me. Don't don't worry, Bob. I don't think I don't think you can do polls on Blue Sky. So mm-hmm. you're, you're safe Look, there. Well, Michael would figure out how to do one. Look what I yeah. figured out. <laughs> Well, I mean, do do we jump in to the funeral and the car? Do we jump into the introduction of Holly at this point? I mean, it is interesting that Holly becomes such a pivotal character, not just for this story, but for Stephen King as a whole, because her her introduction is very muted like she's introduced Mm -hmm. as janie's cousin we're told a a little bit about her that she speaks with a mutter and no eye contact we're told she doesn't have any of janie's looks and she's (laughs) akin to a spinster we we can gloss over that for now Um, thanks bill good good observations bill yeah yeah (laughs) yeah um but we, we, we just get this this little bit of uh, not glowing detail about her. But but then there must be 40 or 50 pages where she's not mentioned again. And then by the time she is mentioned again, now she's becoming like a, yeah, like a much more pivotal character to King and to to the story. I wonder I wonder if King envisaged how vital Holly was going to become to his his overall kind of works at this point because it was interesting that we we got a little bit of her and then 40 pages with nothing yeah i would i i imagine he didn't know i don't Mm. you know and it i mean you guys have probably had that happen too where you think somebody's like a side character and then they're like actually no 
I'm I'm actually a main character and you're going to find that out because I'm not going to leave the story alone. And so I always think that's kind of fun when that happens. Yeah, it is. It's real fun. And I actually think that's exactly what happened, that he intended in his mind maybe that she wasn't going to be, you know, any more than, you know, a maybe just another character. But something about her picked his interest and made him re- rewired how he wanted to do the story. That's that's how I envision it. Maybe maybe that's right, maybe that's wrong, but that's how I'd see that that she she was more than an afterthought. And I mean, I'm glad because we get to see her her arc as we go through this. And it it's 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 as about as incredible as Bill's, you know. And we see her change within this novel. Mm. Um once she is given purpose, there's nothing she can't do. And uh, the same with Bill, you know, other than, you know, getting a heart attack. But, yeah, you know, but, uh, you know, um, purpose means a lot to these characters. Having a sense of worth, you know, that that's important to them. Uh, even to Brady. Um, yeah. You know, in, in a sick and twisted way. Yeah. I mean, what's your initial reaction to Holly? And I mean, we're we're only going to be talking in terms of Mr. Mercedes, which I I don't know if Mm -hmm. that's going to make it difficult for Laurel, who's read far more, but you're going to have to cast your mind back to when you hadn't read any other things with Holly. And I suppose the same with Bob. You said you've read The Outsider. Mm Mm-hmm. I well and and I it's been a while since I've read them though. So I feel like, you know, Mr. Mercedes I've been rereading in preparation mm. for this. So I feel like that's much fresher in my mind anyway. But yeah. I don't know. I think I feel like initially and I'm I'm gonna go ahead and put this out here. I had Bill Hodges also is one of my literary crushes, so that probably like filters some ways about how but I in part when when I read it for the first time I was so like upset about Janie because I'm thinking like oh cool okay he's gonna have this love interest you know this Mm. is great like he's had this kind of lonely life and then when what happens to her does and I was just like the fuck did you just do yeah so then when they bring Holly in and the way that they that she's compared to Janie and I'm like, well, this is not a Janie replacement. This is bullshit. You know, like he got, and, and I, I was seeing more in terms of that. I'm like, who are these fucking people? You know, like, cause I'm, I'm thinking that Janie's going to play this big role and then she doesn't, um, except I guess as, as a little bit more of an impetus. So, and, and yeah, I mean, also maybe that was intentional too, you know, because that's essentially in a way how Bill's going to be feeling too. He's, you know. He's lost someone, which I think, again, is part of why I really love this story. I love the brilliance of that, of his, you know, because he doesn't do the insta-love thing. He doesn't go like, oh, my God, you're my soulmate. It's more just like, wow, I got to have sex, and that was unexpected. Cool. (laughs) You know, oh, you're hot. This is great. We seem to be getting along. This, Oh, fuck me. That's over now. Okay. And, you know, so he's kind of like the, the fact that he has to conceal that any of that happened at all as things go on, too. Um. I feel like it's really is really touching that adds, you know, more layers to him. But but yeah, I mean I feel like it definitely colored my perception of Holly initially and and probably Hodges as well. Yeah. Did you feel that hot were you surprised that like Hodges after the death of Janie is kind of more business as usual? There's not there's not a lot of time for grief. Or do you think I mean, I, I can see how it, it, it does kind of fit his personality and exactly the type of person he is. And probably there's a lot of grief, but it's not on the page because he has to present a, as this kind of no-nonsense guy. And he does still have this, um, you know, the, the, these murders to investigate, but it, it obviously ups the stakes. It makes it as personal as it could have been, but I don't, I don't know. We don't see, we don't see as much grief as perhaps I would have expected, but I, I, I guess like he could just be focused on like, look, I, I've got to get this guy now. Well, and in a way he's also kind of trying to see YA because if he admits or goes into the fact that he was having a relationship with her at all, that puts him in a lot deeper shit with Huntley 
and Isabel. So I feel like in some ways it's kind of self-preservation and a, and a way to keep his hand in the investigation because if he gets yanked out of it because they've determined he's, you know, mm. <clears throat> he's too involved or he committed some, some indiscretions there, then he doesn't get to be involved in it. He doesn't get to, I don't know. I, I, it feels like motivation and also, you know, and I don't, I, I know you certainly can't make like assumptions based solely on a gender, but he's an, a little bit older dude. He's very traditional in his mindset. And I know like I have commonly seen it in men that I know um, that something will happen, a loss, a major loss. And they go immediately into, all right, what needs to be done? Mm. You know, I'm going to resolve these things. We're going to get, you know, the funeral over and the paperwork and all this stuff. And in my experience, I, I, I have often seen and I guess not just men either, people who are used to taking charge and, and used to being responsible for things, not falling apart until the second that they're not needed anymore. Like as mm. soon as that happens, then everything hits at once. So that was kind of the impression I got from, for as far as how he processed that. Mm. You could, you compartmentalize. I, I did the same thing when my father died. It's my mom was not in a good place and I wasn't either, but somebody had to, guide and so me and my sister and my um brother-in-law um took charge you know and i didn't really have a any type of uh any type of grief or anything like that until um until i read uh to my family what i was going to read at my father's funeral and that's when i had you know the time to do it but i didn't have before that i didn't have time i mean yeah. because shit had to be done um, that we had everything in order. It's just, you know, and we were prepared for this, but so I, I can relate to that. That's a car, you know, compartmentalization that, that people have not just men, but anybody, you know, my sister's, uh, almost, and she, she's actually worse than I am, you know, when it comes to that. And, you know, because me and her, she's, are you okay? Are you okay? Are you okay? Are you okay? And she's like, I'm going to handle this in my, my way. And you're going to handle this in your way. And, but right now we just need to get, you know, we're going to have our, our stuff together so we can just get this passed. And that's, I think that's where he was coming from. My only bad thing about the book though, is that there should have been a little bit more grief. I'm sorry. Just, I, you know, I think there, there could have been, and I'm not talking about the famous shower decompression scene or anything like that, <laughs> you know, but I am talking about is that, Possibly after that long and terrible day that we see him actually go home. And we, we do have a brief moment where he cries in the hallway, but I would, to me, I think it would have had a lot more impact if he finally made it home and just collapsed on the floor and rolled up in fetal position and, you know, and, and not moved. That would have, you know, if I have any thing about the book that I really didn't like, it was that we didn't see that. That would have really, whew, man, that'd have been a tearjerker for me right there. Yeah. So, um, but I mean, it's nothing's perfect. I didn't write it. So, I mean, you know, and I probably wouldn't have thought of it either, you know, but that's hindsight's twenty twenty, right? <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, when, when Holly was introduced, I didn't see her as being a replacement for Janie. I mean, I don't think anyone could replace Janie King has done this marvelous thing where he, I, I almost, I wanted them to be soulmates. So he, he did it again where it was just absolutely crushing. I did not expect that to happen. I didn't think that we were going to lose Janie. Um, and so horribly too. Yeah. Yeah. And, Oh, that, yeah, the moment, I haven't got it in front of me, but, like, I I think her last moment is she hears, like, uh, Bill's ringtone, and it makes her smile, and then, boom, yeah. the car blows up. She's wearing his hat, isn't and she? she's wearing really the fedora. Hat on her hat. Yeah, yeah, she's wearing his fedora. God. He mm. didn't mm -hmm. even get the fedora, which is like if he'd... If he'd have had it, that that would be like your in 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 like the central place in your apartment, a fedora. 
He didn't pull the Indiana Jones and snatch it off of her corpse before it had a chance <laughs> to incinerate. No, no. That's in the author's preferred edition. <laughs> It'll be coming out later. <laughs> you know, when, when Laurel said that, you know, Holly, you know, like, who in the hell's Holly? Why is he introducing Holly? She's not like a Janie surrogate or anything like that. Immediately, immediately made me think of Beer Fest and when Landfill died and his cousin comes up who's played by the same actor saying, y'all can call me Landfill too. <laughs> you know? and it's like, and it's like, I don't know why I thought that. It's like, it's like we don't need no Holly. And you can call me Janie if you want to. You know, that would, that'd have been like really Just make things easier. creepy. Yeah. You know? <laughs> It's never a bad time to bring up Beer Fest, though, so. No, it's never a bad time. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to This Is Horror. Now, as you could probably tell, that is not the end of the unboxing of Mr. Mercedes by Stephen King, because it is such an epic tome that we're going to have to do this over multiple parts. So join us again next time. We'll all be back, including Laurel Hightower, We'll be talking more Mr. Mercedes by Stephen King. But if you want to get that and every other episode ahead of the crowd, become our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash this is horror. You'll also be able to submit questions to each and every interviewee. Coming up soon, we've got Richard Chismar, and he co-wrote Gwenda's Button Box for Stephen King. So if you're a King fan, you're going to want to check that one out too. Okay, before I wrap up, a little bit of an advert break. Meet Otto and Cecil, two brothers growing up privileged in the Welsh countryside. They enjoy watching nature shows, playing with their pet pony, impersonating their grandfather, and killing to help. Murder is the family business after all. Downton Abbey, this is not. What this is, the groundbreaking new novel, Not Forever, But For Now, by Chuck Palnick. You may know Chuck as the author of Fight Club, now you'll know him as the author of Not Forever, But For Now, wherever books are sold. Twenty years ago, Faith York watched her father get dragged into the earth by a spider-armed woman. Now, after so many years of denial and running, it's time for Faith to go home and face the truth. A spiraling rabbit hole of reopened wounds, shadowy cults, and eldritch horrors await in the ungodly duology. Two novellas by S.H. Cooper. Available now in ebook and paperback from Cemetery Gates Media. As always, I would like to end with a quote, and this is from Elbert Camus. Without freedom, no art. Art lives only in the restraints it imposes upon itself and dies of all others. I'll see you in the next episode second part of the unboxing of Mr. Mercedes by Stephen King. But until then, take care of yourselves, be good to one another, read horror, keep on writing, and have a great, great day. This is Horror Podcast.